In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talked to Alan Lobach, co-founder of SkyMall. He talks about his greatest weakness. He also talks about a point in time when they didn't ask permission permission for something and he says we couldn't have screwed up worse and how almost endangered a really influential relationship for them also he talks about one of the worst pieces of advice he got and it may be from the people that love us the most here at the very end when he talks about what he treated himself to after sky mall after going through all these big challenges and mistakes that he will share that and much more Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcame big challenges so we can also. Now, have you ever been on a plane, reached in front of you to page through the magazine with all the cool contraptions in it? We all know it as Sky Mall. We're here with Alan Lobach, and he's one of the co-founders of Sky Mall. It was founded in 1990. And SkyMall produces a quarterly in-flight magazine with an annual circulation of more than 20 million copies distributed in airplane seat pockets. Now with annual sales more than $100 million, SkyMall went public through an IPO in the mid-1990s. And it keeps us all sane on very long flights. So thanks for that, Alan. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. And Alan's also the co-founder of Worthworm, which is a web-based valuation tool for young companies because as an angel investor, he reviews upwards of 100 proposals per year and he noticed that entrepreneurs simply couldn't come up with a realistic and defensible valuation. So he's gonna talk about that company as well. So, and I'm excited to hear, Alan, from you, your top advice for business owners based on the big lessons you learned from some of the roadblocks, mistakes with SkyMall and then some of the things you did differently with Worthworm. So I appreciate your time today. Uh, I, I love sharing the stories and hopefully I've learned something over these years. Definitely. And I always like to include a fun fact um, with someone to make you more real because they hear like founder of Sky Mall, I think, you know, he's bigger than life type of thing. So I want to bring you down a little bit for a yes. second. Um, and one fun fact Don't about... Like ever accuse me of being bigger than life. <laughs> one fun fact about Alan is he's difficult to embarrass and is a bit of a jokester. and. Um, What's a, the one story you were telling me about a time uh, that you, I guess it demonstrates you were difficult to embarrass. <laughs> I, I was seated in a, in a restaurant that I frequent in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, dressed in a, in a sport coat and slacks. And at an adjacent table was a family of six, um, clearly grandparents, parents, and their two little children. And I happened to know one of the grandparents. And, and so I was shooting glances over at the table as they were at me. And I noticed that the, the young daughter uh, accidentally knocked over a glass of iced tea. And I was terribly embarrassed at, at having done that. When they got up to leave, uh, the grandfather, who I knew, brought the family over to, to introduce them to me. So I stood up and I shook everybody's hands. And, and when I got to the little girl who had knocked over the iced tea, she was clinging to her mother's leg tightly and her face was just buried into her mother's thigh out of embarrassment. And, and so I felt bad for her. So I went to my table, picked up my pitcher of tea, uh, because they would serve me a pitcher of tea so they didn't have to come back to the uh, table so often. And I walked back over to the young girl I knelt down and I proceeded to dump my pitcher of tea over my head, onto my sport coat, onto my slacks, and the little girl, while the adults recoiled in horror, the, the little girl uh, beamed and turned around and gave me the most rewarding hug perhaps I've ever received. So, um, and, and then I left the uh, restaurant group to clean up the tea so on the ground. That's great. That's a great story. 
Now, Ellen, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the lessons you've learned um, just to start off, and we'll get into some of those you know, high points, but what's, what's been the most painful moment in business for you? You know, business has a lot of ups and downs, but certainly for me, um, relationships uh, are important. And the most difficult uh, and, and painful thing that I went through was at Sky Mall and, and concerned um, some, some differences with our co-founders that, that I and others had. I mean, it, we had four, four founders at the company and um, it ultimately led to uh, a lot of people's careers being cut short either by choice or, or otherwise. And, and the difference, it was very painful and, and very emotional to have those differences with uh, uh, one or more of my co-founders. Was there something that you think you could have seen early on or looking back, like what were some of the signs? Like if someone has a co-founder now, they're looking for co-founders, what were one of the signs you maybe look back on you saw early on that you could have avoided? You know, I, I, I wish I had seen uh, signs. I'm a, one of my greatest weaknesses, candidly, is, is that I tend to trust people until I'm shown otherwise. Um, I'm somewhat idealistic that way. And, and so uh, I had no reason to uh, distrust or question any of my co-founders um, uh, up to this point where we had this uh, great strategic difference. And as a result of this great strategic difference, um, certain actions were taken uh, that uh, were not consistent with the relationship I had enjoyed um, with some of those co-founders. And, um, and, and it was difficult for me to come to that realization and not consider it uh, something that was an anomaly and that this was really a uh, an example of a of a character trait of this individual that I hadn't been aware of previously. So was there, and it, and it hurt a great deal. Was there a difference in a, of opinion? Is that what it was? Well, there was both a difference in in how we were going to handle something strategically, and then there was a difference in how we were going to handle the difference between us. Mm -hmm. And um, and and ultimately. Um, unfortunately, the company started to divide uh, between co-founders, and and that's an untenable situation. I understand that, um, even at, at the tender age I was at then. Um, but I do believe that there were alternatives available to us to rectify that situation beyond uh, the, the one that we ultimately came to. Yeah. Can you talk about where you saw at the time where you wanted saw that direction, strategic direction, where you wanted it to go at the time? Yeah, it, it was an interesting time. In, in We were very fortunate with Skywall because it grew very fast. But, you know, people are fond of saying there's success problems, but um, success can still be a problem and, and it still needs to be addressed. In this particular case, we, we had launched, and fairly early in our launch, um, we got the opportunity to acquire contracts to serve other airlines uh, in their catalog needs. But the contracts, were we to acquire them, would not allow us to immediately implement or substitute the SkyMall program for what they were already using on their aircraft. Uh, the, the arrangement was that if we acquired these contracts, we had to continue the existing program. And if we were able at some point to persuade them to adopt the SkyMall program, which was at that time radically different from their existing programs, then that was, that was ours to do. And I felt very strongly um, that if we proved the success of the SkyMall program, through pilot programs with one or two airlines that one, we wouldn't have to acquire and pay for contracts. Two, that the airlines would come to us and, and we would immediately be able to implement the SkyMall program. And three, that we would avoid many of the uh, financial and other challenges that in my assessment would come with acquiring those contracts. 
yeah. and, um, and, and uh, others felt differently and um, I, I ended up being outvoted and um, we did acquire those contracts and unfortunately many of the problems that, that were uh, predictable uh, came to pass and, and that's what started the, uh, the group uh, our staff to start separating between myself uh, and co-founders who, who aligned with me mm -hmm. versus co-founders that were on the other side of the issue. Yeah. And that's tough because you have four co-founders and multiple people involved. It's hard to, even for any decision, to get everyone to agree, let alone a big decision. So I could see that being a, a tough time. It, it is, and, and I appreciate that uh, oftentimes people say you can't run a business by committee and, and somebody has to have the ultimate word, but you would expect within a co-founding group that um, uh, the person with the ultimate word would, would give serious consideration to the thoughts of, of others. And in this particular case, uh, I and the co-founders who believed as I did, um, did not feel that our... our uh, uh, opinions were, uh, were were treated respectfully and realistically. Yeah. So going from that painful moment, and what's been a proud accomplishment? Well, it's, you know, in the same vein, the, the be, before that happened, certainly the proudest accomplishment was actually getting uh, SkyMall off the ground. Uh, not to mix a metaphor with with airlines, um, but. It was a huge undertaking. It was a huge undertaking with a lot of moving parts. Um, it required a significant amount of capital, and, and we were very fortunate to be well backed by uh, a then member of the Forbes 400. Um, so to see it go live, I literally, uh, Jeremy, um, lay on the floor throughout the night in our call center. Uh, and as each um, GTE Airphone, I don't even know if they're still around, but at that time, uh, GTE Airphone had phones aboard many planes, and we had arranged for calls to be made on the airplane where someone could order while they were flying and pick it up when, when they arrived. That was the radical idea of SkyMall initially, and, and not a lot of people know that now, but that was... That was the radical idea, and so I had to uh, lay in the in the call center, and at all hours of the night, I would get a ring in my ear because I was wearing a headphone, um, and, and GT Airphone would uh, confirm that our cell tower was live or whatever it is they used, and and that people could indeed make calls from the airplane using that particular. Um, a path of, uh, uh, of uh, telecommunication. So that was very exciting to me. And then when we got our first order, obviously, um, that, that was exciting. Do you remember what the first order was? I don't. Uh, I apologize. Well, uh, what about one of the first few orders? Do you, what was like that you remember coming in? I'm just curious what was in SkyMall at the time? Like what, what did someone order? Well, understand that, that um, the SkyMall in those days when we started, um, we, we didn't know what would sell aboard an aircraft. Um, we felt that we could read sales numbers from mail to the home catalogs and, and pick good sellers from that, obviously. And then over time, we would be able to correlate what sold well in the air versus what sold on the ground. So we fashioned SkyMall as a mall in the form of a catalog and we asked existing catalogers um, like Homaker Schlemmer and Spiegel and others that participated in the first uh, in the first book to take a store within the mall represented by a series of pages mm -hmm. so we had everything in there from electronics to kids toys to clothing to travel accessories uh, things of that nature. I can remember one particularly funny story, if I may. Um, Hamaker Schlemmer at the time was offering an electronic mosquito repeller uh, that you placed on your uh, belt, if you would, 
and it simulated the sound of a dragonfly's wings. Now, a, a, a dragonfly apparently is a natural predator of a mosquito. I didn't know that at the time, but that's... I didn't know that either. That, that, that is why this electronic uh, gizmo uh, would repel mosquitoes. So we got a wonderful order from folks who were heading to Belize, which is a popular uh, scuba diving spot on the Mosquito Coast, and they ordered four of these. There were four people going, and we were, we were thrilled to be able to help them with that, and it was a sizable order. Um, and, and all people, I think, know that you try and maximize the size of your orders through upsell and cross-sell and things like that. And so we were pleased with the size of the order. About four to six weeks later, we got a package in the mail sent to our customer service department and all four mosquito repellers were in the box and they were accompanied by a letter that basically, uh, to, to make a long story short, suggested that the only way that these electronic mosquito repellers were useful was if you took them off your belt and and beat a mosquito over the head with them. That wouldn't work very well. <laughs> Which so so they obviously they wanted a refund. At that time, we were very very focused on uh, on customer service. It had been drilled into me at my prior employer and and others. So we set our customer service uh, lead to try and figure out whether we had a poorly performing product in the catalog, which we didn't want, or, or whether there was some other explanation. She ended up contacting the Belize Embassy in Los Angeles and found out that dragonflies are not indigenous hmm. to Belize, and therefore simulating the sound of the wings of a dragonfly in Belize would indeed have no effect on mosquitoes. So we had a properly working item that we could be proud of, but we learned an important lesson, and that's that we needed to do some uh, some research so that when we included copy next to the item, that uh, it reflected its capabilities and limitations uh, accurately. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's any way you would have actually known that. That's pretty, I mean, you you went to pretty far lengths to figure out if this thing actually worked or not, so that's that's pretty impressive. Well, thanks. We we did, and we and we took pride in doing that. Um, but one could argue that we could have uh, done a bit more research in those days. Um, I'm dating myself, but the internet wasn't around, so it, it wasn't like we could jump on Google and, right. and look up dragonfly and Belize. And as you've properly pointed out, I'm not sure even if we had that technology available to us, that it would have occurred to us at that moment to do that kind of research. Yeah. So but it was an important lesson. That is, Alan, tell me what's one of the big roadblocks you ran up against in business and how you got through it? You know, one of the biggest roadblocks, great great question, Jeremy, by the way, um, Thank you. And, and I find this roadblock, um, there, there's actually two, and I find it common to most startup businesses. There, there are some exceptions, but most startup businesses uh, have a chicken and the egg problem and they also have the problem of having too much business with too few customers. Um, the chicken and the egg problem for us at SkyMall, since that's what we're focusing on at this moment in the, in the conversation, was that the airlines wanted to know which catalogers were going to participate in, in the initial SkyMall catalog. You know, where are we going to get Spiegel? Where are we going to get Homaker Schlemmer? Um, and Similarly, the catalogers wanted to know what airline they were going to be on because the demographics among the airlines differed at that time and I think perhaps still do, although competition has been diminished somewhat. Um, so, so that was very difficult for us um, in, in getting people to commit to, to participate both at the airline side and in the catalog side. Then the the having too much business. Well, how do you get them to commit? Go back to that one for a second. <laughs> <laughs> the the thing that I found is most effective in in doing that is is to forge a relationship strong enough to get a conditional commitment. 
In other words, uh, you, you forge a relationship where uh, the party is willing to write an agreement, negotiate and write an agreement, where all corners of the agreement are covered, but it doesn't go into effect unless certain specified things are accomplished within a certain specified time frame. Mm -hmm. Not unlike tranching an investment based on milestones. So that allowed us, when we were able to enter into conditional arrangements, that allowed us to go to airlines, for instance, and say, look, if you say yes, we know by virtue of these contracts that we can present this company, this company, and this company in the catalog. And so when others encounter that problem as I mentor them, I, I try and push them toward uh, trying to uh, ink a conditional agreement. Yeah. And, and that will go a long way toward, toward solving that problem. Yeah, and I want um, you to go to your next one, but so knowing that, what do you do with Worthworm? Knowing you, you, you have the chicken and egg problem with Worthworm too, right? Uh, somewhat, not not quite as. Um, again, this is the internet age, so we can market to our end customer without necessarily going through an airline, for instance, or some other channel uh, of distribution that we don't um, we don't command or manage. So it's not as serious for us in this particular case. That being said. Um, we are certainly looking to partner with with certain companies who already have established relationships with our target market, which are entrepreneurs who's who are seeking angel investment um, and angel investors themselves. And we have pushed uh, to to generate conditional agreements with some of those folks. In many instances, the conditional agreement is based on our proving that our pre-money valuation analytic platform, our computational platform, will return a reasonably accurate pre-money valuation. Mm -hmm. And that's something we're comfortable with. Um, we're going through the calibration process now. Um, but as part of that calibration process, if I may, um, indulge for a moment, we would welcome the, the assistance of any entrepreneurs who have recently closed a round of angel financing. And I say recently, within the last 90 days, I, I would welcome them to get in touch with me directly and hopefully you'll provide that information and, and help us calibrate this tool so that it will be of the very best benefit to them when they next go out for a round of, of capital because this uh, the Worthform tool is, is going to literally um, change the conversation between entrepreneurs and angel investors. It's going to focus it much more on strategy and much less on um, how did you come up with that pre-money valuation, what pre-money valuation method did you use and why do you think that that was appropriate and sort of these arcane, contentious issues that come up between mm -hmm. angel investors and, and entrepreneurs today. So I, I would welcome, um, I would welcome entrepreneurs who have, have uh, closed a recent angel round to contact me. We would uh, uh, dearly appreciate their assistance. Yeah, and I have a question about this later, which I'm saving about one of those interactions that you may have had with. Uh, potential in investment uh, company but um, so the chicken and egg uh, was one big roadblock what was the what was the other one the other one was that that and again not just with SkyMall or with Worthworm um, you generally most startups have too much business with too few customers at some point in in their uh, in their growth right. and that's because there aren't a lot of early adopters um, you know, except for certain technology products that have a heritage to them, it's difficult to get your first client in, in many instances. And when you do get that first client, suddenly all of your business is with one client. In our case, we, we had multiple catalogers 
but we had one airline that we were able to sign uh, sign up. So all of our business was dependent on on that airline. And at that particular time in history, the airlines were very weak. Uh, we uh, I think um, we had just within months before launched the attack in Kuwait um, to to drive Iraq out of Kuwait. And uh, the, the airline industry was suffering from high fuel prices. And, um, and so it was a difficult time for the airlines. The airline we ended up launching on Eastern was in fact in receivership at the time that we signed the contract with them. And we went live on, I believe, mid-October, October 16th, if memory serves. And, uh, and they went belly up full belly up wow. in, in January. So we were only on them for about uh, four months. And then suddenly uh, we had printed all these catalogs and we had no airlines carrying them, uh, which was very scary for us. We were, of course, in negotiations with other airlines. But one of the things that if, if you can find a silver lining in, in a very dire situation, um, the silver lining was that not one day passed between the time the Eastern Airline Airlines failed to uh, to continue flying, and when we picked up our next airline, uh, not one day passed did we fail to get at least one order. Now it might not have been a large order, but we got an order, which meant that people had taken the SkyMall catalog off the plane, hmm. which is something that we had encouraged them to do, and had ordered from their homes or hotels or, or elsewhere um, and that was very encouraging and told us that we were really on to something. Hmm. Yeah, that so, is, because that's scary. That's uh, later we signed up our second airline and, and the rest is history as they say. So what are two, so going from some of the roadblocks that you, you went up against, what are some mistakes that you look back that you learned from? <laughs> There are so many mistakes, and I, I just tweeted out the other day um, that an excess of cash makes uh, for a, a lot of mistakes, and it also makes up for a lot of mistakes. Um, we were in our first entrepreneurial venture, um, all of us, uh, the four founders, and everything was new to us. It was very. It was a wonderful time. I, mean, I ran around at, at two o'clock in the morning when I was the only guy in in the office, and I would scream, "I love this job! I love this job!" It was just um, it, it, to to take something uh, with a blank canvas and begin to fill it in and see it come to life is is, is so rewarding. But one of the things that we were silly about give you an example is as we were um, negotiating with Eastern Airlines we suggested that they uh, send us their their sample contract that we might get get some advanced idea of what we'd be getting into so they uh, took control of the the contract writing process and there was it was about 40 plus pages if memory serves and there was a section as there are in contracts that was titled intellectual property and none of us had any experience with intellectual property and the verbiage in that section for a number of iterations of the contract was standard language to be inserted and in being naive <laughs> and even ignorant um, we, di we didn't give much concern to that standard language we figured that was would be fairly innocuous yeah sounds like it uh, we, we, we came upon a critical time where we had to make a decision to go forward with printing the catalog. And if we failed to meet the print date, uh, there were substantial financial penalties. I think at that time it was $5,000 a day. Wow. Um, and because it was the fourth quarter, and that's the busiest time for catalogs, if we, if we didn't make that print date, there was not only would we suffer the financial uh, challenge, of penalties, but we might not be able to print in the fourth quarter because that's when they were busiest. So we hadn't yet signed up Eastern and we had to make a decision whether to go forward and 
uh, and print Eastern it catalogs with Eastern's name on the cover. And we did, but we did not let Eastern know that because it obviously would have diminished our leverage with them. Right. We, shortly thereafter, we went to a, a trade conference and we met our key contact at Eastern and he presented us with the latest version of the contract and suddenly the standard language had been inserted and the standard language was anything but standard. What it said was that Eastern Airlines will own the SkyMall name. Hmm. And we were stunned uh, because we had intended from the outset to establish SkyMall as a brand, uh, both in the sky and frankly on the ground as well in hotel rooms and elsewhere. So we put up some, some arguments against it and finally the gentleman, the, he knocked those arguments back and finally the gentleman said two things. He said, first of all, if, if somebody pies, buys a coffee pot off of SkyMall and they don't like it or it doesn't work, they're not going to remember that they bought it from SkyMall, they're going to remember that they bought it from Eastern Airlines and that's why we want to own your name. And then, which may have actually been true at that time, it's certainly not true now, um, but at that time, it may have been true. Um, secondly, he then pulled the big guy, small guy on us and said, look, we're big, you're small, you need us more than we need you, live with it. And we went in, said, give us an hour to think about it, knowing in the back of our minds that we had committed to printing Eastern Air Airlines catalogs and had committed considerable money to that and uh, we huddled for an hour and we came back and we told him no and uh, he caved hmm. um, and, and we were able to reach an agreement on the intellectual property clause and ultimately on the overall agreement and the money we spent to produce uh, Eastern Airlines catalogs turned out to be well spent we were able to launch at the time that we wanted to launch, but let me tell you, you never saw four guys uh, swallowing harder. You were sweating through your shirt, probably. <laughs> with, with bigger pits in their stomach than, than us. Did you have a backup plan? Like, what if he didn't fold and you go, no, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. or was that not even an option? Hey, we were so nervous at that time that I can't, if we did have a backup plan, I can't recall it. <laughs> Um, the only thing that I can think that our backup plan would have been, candidly, is um, that the pages weren't branded on the inside as Eastern, so we would have had to scrap the covers, the outside cover, which is four pages, you know, front and back, front and back. Right. And we would have had to pull out some pages um, that were devoted solely to Eastern product, like models of their airplanes and stuff like that, right. where a couple three, four pages. So we knew that the bulk of the catalog would remain intact, but would it remain seasonal and topical and relevant by the time we secured our second airline, or our first in that case, if, if Eastern chose not to go with us? Right. That, was, that was the big question. Because we, you know, when you can't come to the fourth quarter, we emphasize toys um, because you have Christmas holiday mm -hmm. and you have Hanukkah holiday yeah, yeah. Um, and things like that. So, so the composition of, of a catalog will change seasonally yeah. and whether that would have been appropriate for, uh, for a later date, one would have to question. So I'm, I'm not sure we had a very good uh, backup plan at all. And, and that, that's the only one that I could think we possibly had, and, and I'm pulling at straws with that one. Right. So how would you do things differently if you were to go back the second time around? I think you were, you were telling me something about um, Atlanta Airport. What, what would you have done differently <laughs> with that? Well, again, I exuberance of youth is a wonderful thing, but you can, uh, you can overplay your hand sometimes. Uh, Hartsfield Airport in, in Atlanta was a main hub of Eastern. Eastern was based out of Miami at the time, but uh, Atlanta was a main hub. And after we signed the contract with them, uh, we got the bright idea to put stands in each of 
Eastern's gates at Hartsfield Airport. And those stands would hold Sky Mall catalogs. The idea was that we would give people waiting for the airplane to take off or waiting for one to land to have something to look at and we would increase our chances of a sale and increase the familiarity with the Sky Mall catalog. We didn't ask permission. We didn't ask permission of the airport and we didn't ask permission of Eastern to do that. And uh, an Eastern executive uh, happened to fly through Hartsfield Airport and um, that should have been no surprise to us again since it was a hub and apparently that individual hit the roof um, wondering what the heck all these Sky Mall catalogs were doing in their gate areas and of course people would leave them on the seats and the airport didn't like the mess and I mean we couldn't have screwed it up worse quite candidly. We could not have screwed it up worse. And we spent some money um, getting the appropriate fixtures to, uh, to hold these catalogs and having a person at Hartsfield Airport to keep them replenished and things like that. So this was not without some investment on our part. Well, it, it literally endangered our, our whole uh, relationship hmm. with Eastern and our, our then CEO um, took a very harsh call from Eastern and, and then literally uh, hopped on a plane to Miami uh, calling his wife en route to send him a change of clothes and some toiletries because he didn't know how long he was going to be there and he sat in this individual's office, uh, outer office, for days uh, demanding a, a meeting with this individual and this individual was so angry with us that he, I think he sat there, I, I may have this wrong, but I think he sat there for three days before, wow. before he got a face-to-face -face meeting with the individual and we were able to smooth things over and part of smoothing it over was removing everything from Hartsfield Airport so right. that ended up being a sunk cost for us and, um, and an embarrassing situation that could have uh, you know, if if Eastern had seen fit to share that incident with a number of other airlines, um, it, it may have made our opportunities to sign other airlines more difficult. Yeah. We'll never know. But um, yeah, that was that was another screw up on our part. It seems like a good idea, though. Actually, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> the, the the road to hell is. <laughs> intentions as they say so um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs make mistakes with good intentions right. um, and uh, you know we've seen it of late with Mark Zuckerberg who I don't know personally and have never spoken to or met but you know he's rolled out a number of things that we've all read uh, in the press and he's ended up having to back off of because of privacy concerns or something else um, I'm sure he had good motives um, and, and was hoping to promote, introduce and promote a functionality that um, he, he thought his audience would find very, very helpful. Right. But it backfired on him. So, Alan, what would be, what's a good piece of advice that you would want to make sure another business owner knows? It, you know, my, my advice, and I'm often asked that question, Jeremy, and, and I'm fortunate in that. I'm fortunate that, that people think I know enough um, that, that they ask me for advice and it's very rewarding. Um, I don't think there's any particular piece of, of narrow business advice that people would find very helpful because it's not going to apply generally to, to a, a large group of businesses except for the chicken and the egg and the too much business at once. So I'm, I'm, the advice I'm going to give entrepreneurs and, and, and your viewers and listeners is, is this, and I learned it the hard way, and, and it goes back to your um, initial question about pain um, and a painful moment. You are not the ventures that you are working on. That is not your identity. I was not Sky Mall, I am not Worthworm, and I am not any of the ventures, the many ventures that I've done in between. What I am and what you are are business people with a certain set of skills, 
And those skills hopefully increase in breadth and depth and clarity over time so you become better business people. And if a venture you're applying those skills to at any given time happens to fail, however you define that. And I often think in business, we define failure too narrowly. Um, you know, it's, uh, and we define success, by the way, too narrowly. You know, we tend to peg it solely to financial. Um, and if it's financially a success, then the business is a success. And if it financially fails, then the whole thing was a failure. And I don't necessarily agree with that. But whatever your definition of, of failure is, if the venture to which you're applying your skills to today fails, you and your identity are still intact. You are still a skilled business person, probably a more skilled business person for having, quote, failed in that venture because when people succeed they seldom take the time to look back and figure out how they could have exceeded in a greater fashion they're too busy enjoying their success and taking the pats on the back that come with that success but when one quote fails um, they tend to do a post-mortem and they tend to figure out what they could have done differently as you're asking me the question now what could you have done differently in, in, in times of challenge and failure? And the greatest thing I could have done differently to save a tremendous amount of heartache for myself, to save a tremendous amount of um, self-questioning and, and self-doubt was to realize that I wasn't the venture I was working on. I was a business person. I had skills. I acquired other skills. That venture, for reasons connected to me and not connected to me uh, directly, may or may not have brought the best out in my skill set. But the next venture might be the one that does. No different than an actor with a movie. Some actors go in and they hit, hit a role that brings out the very best in him or her and they're very proud of it and it goes on to critical and public success and that very same actor uh, will be involved in another film and it doesn't bring out the best in his or her abilities and the movie gets panned by both critics and and by the public but when is was that the time when you felt that for yourself like that you well, linked your identity to the venture that you look certainly, back on. Certainly Skymo was the closest to it. I mean, I, I, can't, um, I can't emphasize enough. It's an extremely personal story. Um, but I can't emphasize enough the pain that I felt in, in the differences that I had with my co-founders and our inability to come together as co-founders and find alternatives to the challenges that we were having amongst ourselves beyond what ultimately happened. And uh, my departure from SkyMall um, is, is still, uh, well, I'm very proud of my time there and I'm very proud of what we accomplished. Uh, my departure from SkyMall and, uh, and, and the way it occurred is, is still among the, the most painful memories I have period, let alone just oh. in business. Yeah, because if, if someone didn't know any difference, they'd be like, you know, Alan uh, links his identity to Sky Mall. That's a pretty good identity. You yeah, know? yeah. There, there's, a, you know, there, there's a lot to be said about not judging a book by its cover. You know, you, you often tell you, how, how many times have you seen in the news where a married couple was getting divorced and you thought they had the, mm. the best marriage. Um, you, you know, you never know what's going on behind closed doors right. and, and the scars that that can leave. Right. And, um, and this one left a, a deep scar for me. Yeah. And, and I made a, a point of doing things differently after that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. It's hard to do, but it's a good piece of advice. Um, what about a piece of advice you got from a mentor? 
that's been most valuable to you? I think the greatest piece of advice I got, and again, it, it, it's a general piece of advice, um, it, it is that one of the best things that you can do in life and, the, and in entrepreneurship is maintain perspective. Um, in entrepreneurship, one of the great things about entrepreneurship is that there are so many things that are unpredictable. Um, you start with a blank canvas and you start filling it in and a lot of things are outside your control. Um, and some are even outside your influence. And as you ride the ups and downs of entrepreneurship, and they are high ups and they are very low downs, you've got a lot of people riding on you. If you have outside investment, you've got those pressures. You have your own ego on the line. Perhaps you have family and friends um, and their money tied up. Um, that's a lot of pressure. And you can very quickly lose perspective, both when things go well and when things go poorly. And I think the most important advice I ever got from a mentor, and oddly enough it came uh, from my managing partner at, at an accounting firm that I was with even before I launched my uh, entrepreneurial career, was you have to maintain perspective. Um, you have to take a deep breath. You have to realize that uh, the sun comes up the next morning and that seldom are things as bad as they may seem at the moment um, that, that your perspective is out of whack and, and similarly they're, they're not generally as, as positive as, as they are um, at, at those highlights. You know and again I, I turn to Facebook because they're, uh, they're in the news a lot but you know one day Mark Zuckerberg has the high of the IPO and again I don't know him and never have spoken to him um, and then it, within days he was being blistered in the newspapers and on radio and on TV about the poor performance of, uh, of Facebook's stock from its initial IPO um, price. It's so you know he went from up here to, to somewhere down here and the poor guy if he didn't maintain perspective uh, could have crumbled under all of that pressure. How do you maintain perspective? Like when those lows and highs hit, what do you tell yourself or what do you do? Do you have a certain method that you use to get through that? Nobody has ever asked me that question. See, that's, that's why I enjoy talking to a guy that's got a little gray in his beard like me. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he comes up with questions like that. You're like Barbara Walters on <laughs> the internet here. Um, I think first of all, I, I tend to keep a, a sign somewhere nearby uh, that says keep perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a constant reminder to me. And uh, I am not one who tends to talk about my troubles. When, when I have difficulties, I tend to, uh, tend to enjoy my solitude and I kind of huddle Right. by myself and so I'll, if, if I feel that my perspective is getting out of whack I will usually take a day or two away from the office I won't I'd love to go to uh, uh, to Walden's Pond or something something magical like that but I generally don't I usually huddle in my home um, and, and and just slow things down right. for myself um, and, and, and then I start to think clearly. You know, the analogy in, in football oftentimes is that one of the things that quarterbacks have a, a, a very difficult time with as rookies is slowing the game down. Everything's it's much faster than it was in college. And when they can slow things down, they can see the defenses and they can move through their progressions and, um, and, and the game becomes far more comfortable for them. And it's the same thing with an entrepreneur. If you can take a moment and get that game to yeah. slow down a bit for you, I, I think you can regain perspective and have much clearer thought. Yeah. No, I ask because I know some people will go for a run or some people you'll have that, that mantra that you'll just say it'll be better tomorrow. And it sounds like you just take a day and just 
slow things down and take your mind off of business and do something else. It, yeah, but it, but it's not an activity. Uh, it's a, for me, it's not an activity. Yeah. I mean, there was a time that I ran and stuff like that, but I just read a, a very interesting article about a woman that, that I've just connected with on Twitter. Uh, I don't know her personally, Ellen Werta, and I hope I'm spelling her, her name correctly, H-U-E-R-T-A. And, and from the article, she, she had a, um, a very successful career going at Google. And she found at some point that she was being, in her words, inauthentic. And she, at a, at a tender age, I greatly respect her for it, and I told her this in, in, in my tweet to her, at a tender age, she, she had the sensibility to slow things down and get a proper perspective on what she wanted to do with her life and where Google and, and the path she was on at Google fit into that. And she elected to leave Google. She elected to move um, to a different city. And she's got her own startup that I'm unfamiliar with. I know the name of, but uh, I'll let her tout that. Um, and and she's found a, a better place of balance in her words yeah. and um, you know so everybody has their own way but you need to get that perspective in, in, I think in order to be successful otherwise you'll, you'll be you'll ride these waves of ups and downs that are are manic in in their disparities and it can drive you it can drive your family crazy it can drive your employees and your contractors crazy it can drive your investors crazy and it's a very difficult thing to manage once you get into that whirlwind yeah i mean we talked about some of the you know good piece of advice you have and mentors had what's a, a a not so good piece of advice that you received that you found that was not true <laughs> you know uh and and i think every entrepreneur out there will will relate to this uh People buy, and I'm generalizing here, but the vast majority of people um, are not risk takers. And when you throw an idea out to them, uh, they are very quick to try and point out what's wrong with it. And those closest to you oftentimes, your family and friends, because they're concerned for your security, yeah. oftentimes are are the most ardent about trying to dissuade you from taking this risky path um, because they want you to enjoy a stable life and with financial security and raise your family and, and all of those those things and, and they're not bad things right. but they also aren't for everybody um, some people thrive in an entrepreneurial environment I'm one of them and, and I'm willing to accept the risks that go with that. So I think the worst advice I ever got was from all the people that tried to persuade me not to follow my dreams, not to follow where my interests rest, rested, and not to follow my ideas. And um, this notion of, of uh, being afraid of failure, we, we need to cast that away. Failure is okay. It's, it's how we learn. And we have to risk failure to achieve greatness. Yeah. And, and we have to risk failure sometimes to achieve true happiness for ourselves. And um, I would have much preferred people close to me to encourage me to do that than um, to encourage me to to buy into the um, the mainstream thinking of uh, build a nice life. Look, nobody likes what they do at their work, so why should you think you you deserve anything different than that? Right. And uh, and build what for me would have been a very uh, unfulfilling life. Yeah, I mean that's yes. why I wanted to talk to you about this because some of those big mistakes, those roadblocks, you know, people just see Sky Mall as this huge success, and they don't see, you know, some of those big challenges that you had to face, you know, throughout the journey. You know, they just see kind of the end result. So, 
hopefully that will motivate them and, and see like it's not always smooth sailing. It doesn't matter what it is. I. Well, first of all, I, I agree with you completely. If for those sitting in, in, in jobs in big companies, it's not smooth sailing. And, and they've learned, many have learned the hard way, and my, and my heart goes out to them, that the security that they thought they were going to enjoy by being in, in large companies it, it isn't realized and, and doesn't materialize. Um, there, there is no smooth sailing. Um, it, it, it is the rarest of person who has an idea and everything comes together and, and it works out wonderfully and, and there's very little challenge. And if that's what your goal is, um, it's, it's unrealistic. Uh, could it happen? Yeah, but it's going to be the equivalent of a miracle. And, um, and again, there's, there's problems of challenge and there's success problems. But they're both problems. They're different types of problems, but they're both problems. And they need to be solved. And, and that's a challenge. But entrepreneurs enjoy challenges. That's what we thrive on. Um, because entrepreneurs generally, in, in my experience, enjoy learning, enjoy testing themselves, enjoy doing what people say they can't do, enjoy overcoming um, what many people see as insurmountable odds. Right. Um, so it, it's never never a smooth road. If that's what you're looking for in entrepreneurship, then I would encourage you uh, that, that you'll have better luck finding it elsewhere. But frankly, I don't think you'll find it anywhere. Um, I just don't think smoothness is, uh, is a large part of life. So what did you do differently with Worthworm? Not talking about SkyMall, you obviously learned a lot of lessons. What did you do differently with Worthworm? Well, I've done a number of things differently with Worthworm, but candidly I've made a lot of mistakes with Worthworm as well. Um, I'm different from many entrepreneurs and certainly many angel investors because I play on that side of things as well, um, in that I have a voracious thirst to learn. And so I enjoy involving myself in things that I'm not steeped in experience in, um, that I don't have a great background in. And this is the first time with Worthworm that uh, I've been involved, and my partner as well, who's a former aerospace engineer, has built uh, a web-based application. And um, we, we didn't know what that process was. And we've made a lot of mistakes. None of them have been fatal, uh, thankfully, but have we, uh, have we used our time inefficiently at moments along the way? Absolutely. Have we used funds inefficiently at times along the way? Absolutely. I think um, what I've been able to apply to Worthworm that I didn't have back at SkyMall and some of the earlier ones are is a discipline that I've learned over the years um, and what we were speaking about earlier, perspective. Um, I don't react as feverishly to the zigs and the zags as I did before. And I realize that y you need to see some patterns. You need to give time for a strategy to play out. You need to give time for that strategy to yield uh, data in which you can see patterns. And then you need to develop strategies uh, to, to deal with those patterns. And, um, and those strategies can be varied and can have different costs attached to them, both from a human perspective and from a financial perspective. And I think I'm much better equipped at this stage in my career to make decisions among those alternatives than I was earlier in my career. Um, I also have a much greater appreciation for marketing at this stage in my career than I did uh, earlier. 
um, you know, we SkyMall had a very unique proposition in the sense that we had a quote captive audience, yeah. and, and and we made the mistake, all of us, of believing that if if we put a catalog in the seat back pocket of an airplane where people are bored for for an hour or two or three or more, that they would naturally pick it up. It's fairly we, true, though. And that we didn't need to do any marketing whatsoever. Right. And um, it it's somewhat true. It's not nearly as true as you think it is. Um, our conversion rates early in the life of SkyMall um, were, were much, much lower than we ever projected. You know, when you look at um, the conversion was based on how, how many people might see a SkyMall catalog before it was so dog-eared that you needed to replace it, mm -hmm. okay? And, and so uh, we estimated how many uses we would get out of a given SkyMall catalog, and then, then let's say it was six different people that would see it, how, how many conversions we'd get out of those six people. And we uh, vastly overestimated the power of uh, we will build it and people will come. Um, and I now, and particularly in the, in the internet era, um, when people, it's very easy to throw up a website, but how do you get the eyes to the website? And once you've gotten the eyes to the website, how do you get them to convert? And where analytics are, are rampant in the internet, analytics were much, much harder to come by uh, in the detail and the breadth that you have today, they were much, much harder to come by in the pre-internet era. So, um, Have you so, found any particular marketing channels really um, that have done well with Worthworm so far? Well, we haven't introduced Worthworm yet. Okay. Um, we're, we, we very much need the assistance of folks, as I said, uh, entrepreneurs who have, uh, have closed a recent round of angel financing to help us calibrate the testing. We're going into private beta, uh, which will be limited, and we're, we're planning on, on launching uh, now in, in mid-October. Um, but having said that, uh, I am have come to be uh, someone who very much focuses, especially when I'm thinking about other people's business plans and businesses, on channels of distribution. You can have the most wonderful idea in the world, but if you can't get it in front of your target consumers in a timely, efficient, and cost-effective manner um, and, and make those conversions, you're not going to have a successful business. And so I always ask people whose, whose businesses, business plans I'm reading or who I'm listening to about their businesses, how do you intend to get this product or service in front of your target market? For us, we are uh, looking forward to entering into a, a number of strategic partnerships where we can offer a benefit to our partner uh, and they can offer a benefit to us in terms of putting our respective offerings in front of a like target audience. Um, I'm proud to say we just uh, partnered with Arizona State University's uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Group. Mm -hmm. They're going to use Worthworm when we release it, and they're even considering it um, for embedding in their curriculum mm -hmm. uh, for entrepreneurship. And ASU is one of the few uh, colleges across the country that received a five million dollar entrepreneurship grant from the Kauffman Foundation. Um, so they've got a very strong entrepreneurship program and they looked at what we had and decided that we were uh, in focusing on pre-money valuation and the depth and breadth of questions that we ask entrepreneurs in, in considering their pre-money valuation. They decided that, that Worthorm would, would be an, outs, an outstanding tool um, to, to provide to their entrepreneurs and indeed to consider for, 
for embedding in their curriculum as a whole. And we're hoping that that other schools, um, and if you're listening, uh, other schools with entrepreneurship programs across the country uh, will familiarize themselves with Worthworm. They can contact me directly um, and, and consider integrating Worthworm into both their entrepreneurship programs and their entrepreneurship curriculums. Yeah. I want you to Alan, um, just tell people where they can reach out to you. Where's the best place to find you and reach out to you if they are they just want to see what's going on or they're interested in, or know of someone who would be interested in Worthworm? Thank you. Um, I, I'm available on Twitter at, at Alan Lobach. Um, I'll let you provide the spelling. L O B O C K. L O B O C K S. Yes, L O B O C K and first name A L A N. Um, they can certainly uh, email me at a lobach at worthworm.com. That's W O R T H W O R M dot com, sort of like earthworm, but worthworm. Um, and I'd love to hear from them in, in that respect. I have one last question before I ask it, though. I want to hear about obviously, this prompted something. You do a lot of angel investing. What's one of those stories that you remember that that um, someone came to you and just had an outlandish? You know, so I ask this because people who may be approaching angel investors should approach them in a certain way. So, what was one story where someone approached you and you saw it was just out, <laughs> kind of an outlandish valuation? Well, it, it, you're right, and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to to speak about it. The pre-money valuation is perhaps the most contentious issue, or among, certainly a most, among the most contentious issues between entrepreneurs and angel investors. And that's for a couple of reasons. If, if the spread between what an angel thinks your business is worth at a moment in time and what the entrepreneur thinks it's worth at a moment in time is too large, Oftentimes, the angel investor will simply come to the conclusion that there is no transaction to be had. And so you don't get a fair look simply because you don't have a reasonable, defensible pre-money valuation. The second thing is, is if you don't have a defensible, incredible pre-money valuation, oftentimes angel investors will draw the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, that you're not particularly sophisticated. Right. And, and we all know that the quality of the management team is, if not the most important aspect in selecting a venture in which to invest in, is, is in the top two or three. Uh, because ideas are a dime a dozen, it's in the execution that entrepreneurs are made. So I'll, I'll give you an example, and these folks are very good friends of mine, so if they're listening, I hope, uh, I, I hope they'll laugh at this. But they came up with a product that was geared toward pets. And as we know, the pet industry is, is very large and, and people spend tons of money on pets. But this particular, this particular item was a legacy item for a pet that um, was nearing its passing or had passed. Okay. Okay. Um, so you would give it as a gift, or you would buy it for yourself as a remembrance of of this particular pet. That's primarily what it's used for. So one of the first questions you have to ask for an angel investor, and we ask this in our questionnaire, is what's the size of your market? And the size of your market will factor into your pre money valuation. It will also factor into um, whether an angel investor, in fact, a VC will even look at you uh, for reasons that are beyond the scope of this conversation. So they presented me their business plan with a evaluation. And as I quizzed them on the valuation, not even going to what method did they use, because most entrepreneurs have no clue what method to use. It's a pretty arcane question. You know, most of them use discounted cash flow, which most sophisticated angel investors consider to be a completely erroneous way of valuing an early stage company because you're discounting projected income. Um, so how reliable are your projections, right? 
Um, so now they not only have to argue over whether you've picked a reasonable discount factor, but now they've got to argue over whether your projections are even reasonable. Um, so, so entrepreneurs are just ill-equipped, most of them, to answer this question. So to get back to the story, I, I looked at their market size. And they, at that time, and this was some years ago, they had written that the market size was $40 billion annually because they had gone to some publication that said the pet industry is a $40 billion industry annually. What entrepreneurs need to understand is they need to segment their, their market very, very finely because if they had been able to segment, and this is, you're capable of doing this far more now in the internet age than you were before the internet age. So much information is available. But if they had segmented, we needed to find out how much of that 40 billion was spent on legacy gift products right. for, for animals, right? And primarily dogs and cats in this particular case. If we couldn't get legacy, we at least had to know how many are spent on gifts. If they had done that research, they would have found that it wasn't anything close to $40 million. And so, and what you usually get from an entrepreneur when you ask them, how did you come up with this valuation? They say, well, the marketplace is $40 billion. If I get just 1%, right. my company would be worth X. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's nonsensical. It's non-defensible. It shows a lack of sophistication. It shows a lack of effort in, in doing proper research. And it isn't going to be well received by angel investors if, if you present them with something like that. And so Workworm is intended actually to, to not only make it easier for an entrepreneur to calculate his or her pre-money valuation and, and have one that's reasonable and defensible. Um, and we recognize that pre-money valuation is part art and part science. Our position is that the art is in the negotiation. The science is in providing the very best beginning number for that negotiation. And that's what we believe that Worthworm will do. Yeah. And then we hope that by using Worthworm, you, you shift what was once a contentious conversation where you were challenged on how did you come up with this pre-money valuation, what method did you use, and why do you think that's a valid method, to one where both sides will accept the rigor and reliability and, and credibility of the pre-money valuation that we've generated and the conversation will then move to a strategic one and a strategic conversation is one that the entrepreneur should be most comfortable with because what topic what area should an entrepreneur know best and that's his or her company and right. the strategies and and the threats and opportunities that exist for for that company so wouldn't you as an entrepreneur much rather engage in that conversation over strategy and threats and opportunities and SWOT analyses and all of that than you would be answering a question from an angel investor like me who says, what valuation method did you use to come up with your pre-money valuation and why do you think that's a valid method to use? They're just com completely different conversations. It also goes back to what you, your advice that you gave about someone having their identity linked to their venture because they probably feel like it's a personal knock on them if the other person doesn't value it high enough or you know they, they probably link it partially back to them and there's probably some emotion there as well. So I can see that coming into play if you don't have like a kind of like a standard method or like a third party source that's figuring this stuff out, you know. Yeah, well, you're involved in entrepreneurship yourself. So you're, you understand this and that's a very perceptive comment. And, and you see it all the time on Shark Tank, um, which I, I somewhat like and I somewhat don't um, only because I... Um, I, I like it because of the opportunities it gives people. 
I, I don't like it because I think angel investors like myself and, and VCs and others tend to um, value our time too highly and to give a person three to five minutes to uh, to make their argument on what it arguably is a lifelong dream um, I just think is, is, is a bit arrogant of us um, but what you often see in Shark Tank is in the opening in your in an entrepreneur's opening comments he or she must say I'm looking for X amount of money in exchange for X amount of the company many of them don't realize that with those two elements the percentage of the company they're willing to give up and the dollar value they have set a pre-money valuation on the company right. and usually the camera immediately shifts to the sharks and they're writing something down and what they're writing down is the pre-money valuation that those two elements um, convert into and then oftentimes you see that a deal does not come together on Shark Tank for no other reason than the sharks uh, they don't like the valuation, the valuation was yeah way out of whack right and and so your your idea ends up not getting the hearing that perhaps it ought to have or the respect and consideration it ought to have simply because you produced a pre-money valuation that isn't credible and that you can't defend yeah and that's a shame that's an absolute shame because it's avoidable and that's what Worthworm is all about, is trying to help entrepreneurs avoid that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I could probably, I'm holding myself back, because I could probably <laughs> ask about all 100 proposals and what the business were and what happened with them, because it's just, uh, I'm very curious about it. But my last question is this. I want to know what life was like after, this, after um, the sale of Sky Sky Mall. Like, what was one thing that you treated yourself to after the sale? Well, uh, um, first of all, as, as much as you'd like to continue the talk is as much as I'd like to continue it because I, I absolutely love um, being able to share whatever advice and insight uh, entrepreneurs may think I have. Um, I, that gives me a great sense of, um, of reward. And, and so I could talk business all day long. Um, what is the one thing that I treated myself to? I was single at the time, single now as well, but single at the time, I was uh, relatively young and uh, in my early 30s and I took three years off and I traveled around the world. Um, and that's what I treated myself to. Where was your favorite spot that you went when you traveled? Yeah. Lamington National Park in Australia I stayed at a place called Bina Burra Lodge which is parked in a subtropical rainforest and um, it was absolutely my my favorite place I tend to be a person that enjoys the mountains and the quiet and solitude and uh, there, there's nothing like walking out into pitch black and and hearing the stomps of kangaroo and not being able to see them um, and and taking a walk through a subtropical rainforest that um, with, with, with a guide so that they can point out everything that's flourishing in there come to a waterfall that is canopied by the rainforest and sit down and, and eat a sandwich with, with your feet dangling in uh, in crystal clear water, it uh, it was magical. That sounds absolutely wonderful. <laughs> it was ma it was magical. Yeah, and I want to be the first one to thank you. This is as always, it's wonderful talking to you, and I really appreciate you sharing your words of wisdom with the audience. Uh, I'm I'm thrilled to have been asked, and uh, I hope we stay in touch, Jeremy. And I wish you the very best. For sure. Thanks, Alan. Thank you.